Thank you for the introduction. So I've got 10 minutes to tell you about the future of heart transplantation. So I'll quickly skim through the slides that I have. So a, a brief overview of where we are with heart transplantation in Australia and New Zealand. So the first heart transplant in Australia was performed in 1984. And these are the numbers quoted to up till 2016. We've performed 2,714 heart transplants, uh, a total of 2,830 lung transplants, and just close to 200 combined heart-lung transplants. This is for a population, uh, sorry, of uh, a combined population of 29 million. So heart failure in Australia. We perform on average about 100 heart transplants per year in Australia. How many patients do we have with end-stage heart failure or congestive heart failure? We have three, over 300,000 patients with congestive heart failure. And we have over 17,000 deaths as a resultant of end-stage heart failure. And even if you take the population of just below 75 years, because traditionally, uh, tradition, I mean, historically, really, uh, you wouldn't really transplant someone greater than the age of 75, although we are not an ageist society, but that's the reality of it. Uh, patients who are older have other core uh, multifactorial uh, problems as well. And so if you take the, the population of less than 75 years of age, you're still averaging about 1,000 patients who die from heart failure. So this just highlights there is a there is a discrepancy in supply and demand in our heart failure population. Now, where the future of heart transplantation uh, lies in trying to improve or expand the donor pool. And I'm very excited today to tell you about uh, the innovation and uh, I guess the uh, I don't know why that's doing that. Uh, the innovation in the field of trying to increase the donor pool. I'll talk to you about uh, the preservation and the reanimation of the heart after death. And I'll talk to you about the concept of donation after circulatory death, which is a recent concept in heart transplantation. So the legal definition of death is the irreversible cessation of all functions of the brain of a person, or the irreversible cessation of circulation of blood in the body of the person. So you can declare death either, so you can obtain an organ for heart transplantation, either by donation after brain death, or donation after circulatory death. So up until 2014, heart transplants in Australia were only performed from brain-dead donors. In theory though, the first human-to-human -human heart transplant, which was performed by Christian Barnard uh, in South Africa, uh, was performed uh, with a heart donated after circulatory death. The donor, however, was in the adjacent operating room. Now, DCD heart transplantation. The first distant procurement DCD heart in the world with the use of a nomatomic machine perfusion was actually performed at St. Vincent's in 2014. So the heart, which was obtained from a donor declared dead after circulatory death, was reanimated using the transmatic OCS heart for a duration of five, uh, four hours and 17 minutes. The heart was successfully transplanted in a 56-year-old female, and despite requiring early ECMO support for graft dysfunction, the heart recovered to normal function, and she remains alive with an EF of more than 60% to date. So that's more than three and a half years post-heart transplantation. And you will see here Peter McDonald and Kumi Detail pioneered this technology and the field and advanced the field of DCD heart transplantation really in the world uh, with research that culminated years back, probably before I was even born. Uh, so soon after um, we performed the first DCD heart transplantation, we published the, a series of th three individuals 
And what we reported on was the success of early, early to midterm outcomes. So to date, what's the current state of DCD heart transplantation in globally? There have been more than 60 cases of DCD heart transplants performed worldwide. We've performed 20 to date. Uh, the UK has three centres performing DCD heart transplants, Papworth in Cambridge being the biggest centre, uh, a few in Harfield and Withenshaw in Manchester performed their first DCD heart transplant last year and they've performed over three now. There are two main procurement techniques utilised to obtain uh, or harvest the donor organ after circulatory death has been declared and it's the direct procurement protocol and that's what we use here in Australia or the normal thermic regional perfusion protocol. So with the direct procurement pro protocol, what happens uh, when you identify a suitable donor, there is withdrawal of life support, you wait for asystole, there is a two to five minute standoff period following which, which uh, death is declared. Blood is then collected from the donor, um, donor, from the donor because you need the blood to perfuse the transmetic system. Uh, you then uh, in, uh, sort of inject a preservation flush. The organ is procured and placed in the transmetic uh, organ care system. And this uh, gives you the combined ischemic time. Now the team at Papworth also used the normothermic regional perfusion protocol whereby after death is declared, the heart is reanimated in the, in the donor using ECMO, uh, central ECMO, but blood supply to the brain, so the cerebral circulation is occluded, so they occlude the carotid artery. So this is an example of a heart that's been reanimated in the transmetics organ care system. Uh, so you can see uh, there's retrograde perfusion of blood via the aorta. So blood goes through the aorta, perfuses the ventricle through the coronary sinus uh, to supply the right side and then goes back through the pulmonary artery. And never mind. And then you have a little vent there that actually decompresses the uh, left ventricle. So it prevents the left ventricle and the left atrium from blowing out. So that was actually a video from an organ that we, uh, we, we got from Perth uh, and we transplanted yesterday. Uh, this was actually not a DCD donor, however, but we used the Transmatics organ care system uh, because of long, potentially long ischemic time. So if you're, you're retrieving uh, from Perth, so you've got transportation time of greater than five hours, it is helpful that way. Now, uh, this is an echo, basically from our first DCD heart transplant recipient. So as you can see here, initially they had primary graft failure requiring ECMO support, but by day seven, there was complete recovery of the ventricle and ECMO was decannulated at day four. So what is the DCD donor criteria? So at present, uh, we, we only accept donors that are around 40 years of age. We are looking to extend that rule. Uh, uh, donors who have got an anticipated um, withdrawal time of less than 30 minutes. So if you don't go into asystole and death is not declared within 30 minutes, we do not retrieve the organ. Um, no history of cardiac disease and obviously normal cardiac investigations if available. At the very least, we ask for a transthoracic echocardiogram. Coronary angiogram, uh, only if they've got a smoking history or they've got risk factors. We've had really good outcomes with our DCD heart uh, program. Uh, the only, uh, only difference that we've noted is that our DCD uh, hearts have had a higher rate of requiring ECMO support in the initial post-operative period. So that's 41.1% in the DCD group versus 13% in the brain death group. Um, however, there has been absolutely 
no change, no difference in survival. So we've now got data for up to three years, I guess, in the, uh, from the early, early few patients. So no impact in short to medium term survival or rates of cardiac rejection uh, in the DCD versus the brain death group. So although you, you can say that, you know, 20, a number of 20 is not a huge number, but when you're transplanting at our institu institution pre-RDCD program, we were averaging about 25 to 30 uh, transplants per year. So about a five to six patient increase is actually significant increase. So you're increasing your donor pool by 20% or your heart transplant rates really by 20%. Now, I'll talk to you very, very briefly on um, MCS because you've already heard a very elegant and eloquent talk uh, by Professor Fraser. So the future of transplants also lies in the recipient demographic, and that's where durable mechanical circulatory support comes to play. So uh, these are uh, figures for patients on the transplant waiting list. So as you can see, the striking uh, feature here is that compared to the 90s till now, you will find that a higher proportion of patients on our transplant waiting list are bridged with durable mechanical circulatory support, uh, primarily in the form of left ventricular assist devices. Now, I'm not going to delve into this, but we are very, very excited about the Bivacor initiative, uh, which gives obviously total uh, biventricular support because although VADs are great, they enable patients who are in cardiogenic shock and stage heart failure to be successfully bridged to transplant. They do not come without complications. And very briefly, at St. Vincent's, uh, the VAD that we currently use is the hardware. We've implanted about 150 hardware devices. Uh, the other devices that you've already heard about is the HeartMate 2, which is a centrifugal flow pump as well. The heart, sorry, that's the HeartMate 3, a centrifugal flow pump, like the hardware. The HeartMate 2 is a second generation device. It's an axial flow pump. Um, and, you know, this, we've already seen this. Uh, so inflow cannula, outflow graft, blood goes through the ventricle, through the pump, bypasses the ventricle, and goes into the ascending aortas to support systemic circulation. And you, it, it, uh, you've got an external drive line that connects to external power sources. Uh, we have got patients who are supported, uh, successfully bridged to heart transplantation with biventricular support. But as you can see, it, there are two VADs essentially, and that's why we're all very excited about the Bivacor initiative. The total artificial heart, uh, the patient that we transplanted yesterday was bridged to transplant with a total artificial heart. Now, in theory, it sounds very cool. However, the total artificial heart doesn't come without its complications. And this particular patient was urgently listed as he was in septic shock, as there was complications with device-related infections. So the total artificial heart as bridge to transplant, you, you remove or excise the entire ventricle, uh, you excise the four native valves using quick connects. These quick connects are sewn to the atria, the aorta, and the pulmonary artery, and the uh, polyvinyl chloride device is actually just attached on to this quick connects. Now, if you are an adrenaline junkie, you should try this. Try replacing the... Uh, the controller for the total artificial heart. And I have to say, uh, that's the most uh, adrenaline provoking thing that I've had to, uh, had to have done to date. And I have done skydiving and bungee jumping. Um, and this is an x-ray from such a patient. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>